The fog was so thick during the first sinking that engineers could barely see their marks ashore to line up the element. It took 17 hours to place the first element. Finally, number one tunnel element is in place, secured to the face of the north approach. Five more to go, and the last one must be on the bottom by early April, or the spring freshet will force ruinous delays. With the help of the model, we can do what the engineers might often have wished to do, dry up the Fraser River. Although the tunnel elements were laid in an open trench on the river bottom, backfilling with rock covered the elements and produced the same effect as an underground tunnel. Water levels remained comfortably low throughout the months of January, February and March. The engineers had set the 120,000 cubic feet per second mark as the danger line. So far, the river kept well below the line. Twenty days after the first sinking, element number two was in place. This sinking marked another first in tunnel building history with the use of underwater television loaned by the Royal Canadian Navy. Elements three and four were the deepest, lying across the navigation channel of the river. Water level began to rise at the beginning of April now the enemy was time. April 5th, number five element in place. But soon the melting snowpack would turn the Fraser River to raging flood. The first favorable tide for warping out of the dry dock occurred at night. And in the darkness, every man knew without speaking the race he was running. If the river rose before number six was in place, everything would have to stop. Men and machines would lie idle. It would be at least four months before the water dropped again. The river rose steadily, inching toward the danger line. Time was running out for the tunnel builders. There could be no mistakes now. Nothing must delay the intricate operation. So much to be done, but it must be done with slow care and precision. By dawn, the temporary foundation blocks had been placed at the fitting out jetty. The element was floated alongside the jetty and the blocks pulled up and attached to the underside of the element by cables. These men had fitted out five elements before. It was now routine. But this time it must be faster by minutes, hours, hoping to gain a day against the rising river. The two access towers over the element manholes were aligned so they would be exactly vertical when the element was inclined on the river bottom. In the controlled cabin mounted on one of the towers, precision instruments showed the position of the element at all times. An extensive communication system ran from the cabin to the element and sinking rig. The whole operation was to be commanded from this cabin.
precious days have slipped by, but the element is ready. Now, what of the river? In the last hours, the river has risen steadily, past the danger line. But it is not yet in full flood and is actually dropping slightly. The time is now. Crews hurry to their stations. The sinking rig is making its longest trip with the least time to spare. In position, ready for sinking. In the control cabin, last minute checking. The order is to start pumping water onto the element. This is to help the element sink gently to prevent a sudden surge of water onto the large surface of the top of the element. The last men to set foot on the element roof climb aboard the sinking rig. Winch operators take their places and equalize their portion of the load. Not more than 100 tons on each of four sinking winches. Every man stands by, awaiting orders. Hoist operators 9, 10, 11, and 12, report in. Ask me what's your open hand, Bob. They're got them ready. They're opening. No, I've got Number 11, 30, down on the B drum, 0 on A. Number 12, 40, 10 on the B drum, 0 on A. Number 9, 36, 10 on the B drum, 0 on the A drum. Number 10, 32, 10 on the B drum. You'll have to speak up, Fowler. Uh, Leo, will you have o uh, Joe open your number four hand valves now? We're going to start letting in water and start going down. Thank you. Want that for the number four? Nine and ten, take it down. Hoist operators nine, ten, eleven, and twelve. Be prepared to start lowering your load. Nine already. Let's take nine, nine ready. and ten. Number eleven, ready to go. Number twelve, ready. Six. <coughs> you want to start nine and ten? Yeah. Hoist operators nine and ten. Start lowering your load with your B tackle and keep your A tackle slack. Start lowering. There is tension in each man's face. Yet because of his skill and experience in the special function he performs, each has a feeling that he and his fellow workers will win this last battle against the river. Will a diver be prepared to go down? The divers can be prepared to go down. 7.3, 7.3, 111. You can stop her. 14, 410 side. Above three foot mark. You can stop any time. We're three feet above the head. Stop number 11 and 12. Hold 11 and 12. Hold 12. Hold 12. Hold 10 and 11. Hold 9 and 10. Hold 9 and 10. 
Holding nine. Holding ten. I was going to say that anyway, then I started to stutter. <laughs> the pressure is off, and there is time for congratulations. The actual sinking took less than half an hour. Let's get the exact location now. Can we have a reading, please, in 9, 10, 11, and 12? Please, 9, 26 tons on the B drill. Zero. But what actually happened down there under the surface? Not even the divers could see in the silt-laden Fraser River. We can visualize the sinking with diagrams. As soon as the element sank below the surface, it was tilted to the inclination of the trench bottom. In cross-section, we will see that water was then admitted to ballast compartments and the element sank further, controlled by the winches on the sinking rig. The water ballast was adjusted continuously to counteract any uplift caused by changes in salinity of the river. The element was lowered until the temporary foundation blocks touched down on gravel pads in the tunnel trench. More water ballast was added to give the element an effective weight of 1,200 tons. Now there was a waiting period of 24 hours to settle the foundation blocks on the gravel pads prior to final positioning. Then the divers went down with underwater cutting torches and burned through the cables holding the foundation blocks to the element. In this end cross-section, we see the shape of the foundation blocks. Bearing on each block was the piston of a 300-ton hydraulic jack operating within the element itself. These facilitated precise control of vertical positioning. Lateral movement was controlled by shims and screw jacks operated by divers. For the joining, the element was free to slide a few inches along the foundation blocks towards the element already in place. This was done with a pull exerted through the hook by two 75-ton hydraulic jacks inside the element. The rubber gasket around the face of the element sealed off the chamber between the elements. In all this engineering drama beneath the river surface, perhaps the most exciting event was the climax of making the join. With the gasket sealing the chamber between the elements, a valve was opened and a fraction of an inch of water bled off. This brought into play a hydrostatic pressure on the far end of the element of some three or four thousand tons. The rubber gasket was squeezed flat and the joint sealed completely. Thus the river itself was made to do man's bidding in the final conquest. The chamber could now be drained dry and the bulkhead doors opened for access through the elements. When element number six was placed and the chamber drained, the first entry was made an official ceremony. BC Minister of Highways, the Honorable P.A. Gillardy, and project manager, Hans Benson, were among the first men to cross from shore to shore under the great Fraser River. Dees Island Tunnel was now a reality.